Hello, and welcome to episode 567 of the official EstablishTheRun.com podcast. My name is Adam Levitan. I am joined by two best ball bros, best ball mania one champ, Justin Herzig, Michael Leone, author of Best Ball Manifesto. Herzig, how's it going today? We're talking best ball. How can it not be going great? <laughs> There's so many jokes on Twitter. Like uh, People are like, dude, how can you make fun of me? You're talking about best ball 19th round picks in May. and It's kind of a valid point. Anyways, Leone, how's it going today? Uh, I'm, I'm stoked to be talking more best ball. I'm, I'm not going to get best balled out. It's May 24th. Here we are <laughs> recording episode five. Let's go. <laughs> We're in no danger of burning ourselves out on best ball whatsoever. Herzig's doing two streams a week. We're doing a six part series. We're all reading articles. There's no, there's no danger whatsoever. On today's show, it is part five of a six part series. This episode will cover how to approach FFPC best ball and the strategy around that. I implore you to listen to episode one of this series, part one of this series, in which we talked about the basics, what we are um, basing all this off of, what we think about when we're on the clock, how we think about best ball teams. These episodes are specifically designed to help you with the exact structure because they are different between the sites we've already covered, DraftKings, Drafters, and Underdog. Remind you that if you're looking for our player takes for our rankings and the context around those rankings, you need DraftKit Pro. Once you have DraftKit Pro, you can upload our rankings directly into the draft applet on Underdog and DraftKings and some of these other sites as well. So take advantage of that. DraftKit Pro is $49.99. Also covers Dynasty, Redraft, everything you need to get ready for the season. EstablishTheRun.com. Hit the subscribe tab. FFPC has a really interesting tournament. Their flagship is $125 buy-in. Uh, very much more expensive than other sites' flagship. 10,368 entries, relatively small. The biggest difference I think people need to get their head around in FFBC is A, the site is infiltrated by boomers taking running backs at a very early and fast rate, and B, it is tight end premium. So before we get into the exact context structure and all that, Leone, we should talk about how FFBC differs from everywhere else. When you go into an FFBC draft, what do you think about with your scoring system in mind? Yeah, so the tight end premium is different. And then also you've got the one point for 20 yards passing instead of 25. So you get a slight edge to the pocket passers over the rushers relative to playing on underdog fantasy. But in general, what I really like about drafting on FFPC is you know, the ADPs are a little bit more running back heavy, less wide receiver heavy. They're a little bit less rookie heavy than you're going to see on underdog. And for me, it sort of suits the way that I like to draft, which is I can build these teams I don't want to quite say hyper fragile running back teams, but getting one to two running backs early and still being able to build out a substantial edge at wide receiver to take advantage of the full PPR format or to take an elite quarterback or elite tight end early. So I tend to like to draft in this tournament and it's, it's, it's a higher stakes tournament in terms of entry fee at $125, but it's a little bit more reasonable in terms of, advancing all the way through to the finals you can do it with a really solidly built team instead of having to get crazy lucky you know each of the playoff weeks right and i want to talk about that in a second here i just want to get one more take on the tight end premium stuff when we say tight end premium it is 1.5 points for reception by a tight end now obviously our rankings are have that baked in but do you think there's any other tight end things we should be thinking about like are you going out of your way to take two tight ends in the first five rounds. Can we take four or five tight ends on an FFPC team? Because they are undoubtedly worth more. So you can definitely have two elite tight ends early if you think they're gonna have really strong seasons because the other aspect I didn't mention too, it's it's two flexes. So two running back, two wide receiver, a tight end and two flexes. So you can really start multiple tight ends. So you absolutely at the end of the day can take four or five. And also some of the rules about like, if you draft the Travis Kelsey, you only draft two tight ends they go out the window a little bit because you're sort of comparing at the end of the draft, the tight end at flex versus a wide receiver at flex. And sometimes those tight ends are honestly just safer, smarter bets at that point in the draft. So I think you can draft a lot of tight ends, even if you're taking an elite tight end early. Sometimes people in your draft rooms will overly reach and overly account for the tight end premium. So it's a little bit of a feel thing that you have to go through. But currently, you know, we're ahead of the market over on FFPC on Travis Kelsey, Mark Andrews, TJ Hawkinson, like kind of right in line on Pitts and Goddard. So 
um, there should be ample opportunity if you're using the ETR ranks to be pretty in pretty good shape with the tight end position. Justin, let me ask you about the actual advanced structure here because it's not like the other sites. In week one through 14, just like all the other sites, the top two in your 12-person league will advance. In week 15, though, it's a 12-person group, the top two advance. And the super unique thing is that in week 16, it's a 12-person group, but the top three advance. So if you make it to week 16, you have a 25% chance of getting to the final. And the final is only a 72-person final. Now, it's not some outrageous payout like some of these other sites are 200K to first, 75K to second, 25K to third. Tenth only gets $4,000, 2% of first. But still, you are have like an actual, I can see a path to me making the final here. Should this change our strategy where we know there's so many more people advancing through each of those week 15 and 16 groups? Yeah, I think it's that much more important to focus on advance rate. If you go back to Leone's manifesto, like we were saying, hey, advance rate is so important in the underdog format where each round of the playoffs is one out of 16, one out of 16. Um, you know, I don't know the math is right there, but top of my head, it's probably like, I don't know, 7% or something, maybe six. Um, here, we're talking two out of 12, that's like 16%, three out of 12, 25%. Like you can just want to focus on getting teams to advance to the playoffs and you're more likely, as long as you get a, you know, hey, well-structured, get the stacking, all you kind of need is a QB and another tight end, QB wide receiver to go off, and you're probably going to finish in that top three out of 12, two out of 12 or such. So I think, hey, focus on the regular season, focus on building well-constructed teams. And then championship, it's 75 people. That's still enough people that I'm not going to say completely ignore the week 17. I do want to then be thinking about those kind of game stacks again. Um, because it is still a pretty top heavy payout as well with that. Uh, I think it was a 300 K up top. Um, mm. So I want to focus on that, but the rest of the playoffs, just get as many teams through as you can. Yeah. 72 person final 200 K up top. Leone, any further thoughts on these bloated advance rates in week 15 and 16 and how that might change our strategy? No, I don't think it, it changes too much other than focusing a little bit more on advance rate. We still want to be stacking our teams overall for both season long upside and weekly upside. Uh, I guess the only slight thing is you, you know, maybe are a little bit robust in some areas because you, you don't need to hit the nuts at like any stage until the final week 17. Whereas, you know, when we did the podcast on drafters, we're talking about like, you need to hit the nuts for the regular season. You might go really fragile at a position and hundred percent assume, you know, drafting is if you're right, you could dial that back down a little bit here in FFPC. Okay. Very interesting. I wanted to go back quickly. What you said about, running back because my first instinct is when these boomers are taking running backs over and over and over again in rounds one through three i'm just like man i'm gonna have the most outrageous wide receiver core these guys have ever seen at both my flexes i'm gonna have wide receivers i'm gonna dominate them at the two starting wide receiver spots and then i'll figure it out at running back with like i mean you know i'm not it's full ppr like you know there's plenty of guys in rounds seven eight nine ten and by the way if you are a draft pro subscriber we are working on our late round running back targets article can go up soon. You know, to me, that kind of leans into zero RB. Leone seemed to disagree saying you can get a couple running backs very early and then kind of, I think you're saying, ignore the position from there and still win at wide receiver. I just wanted to double click on there for a second because that wasn't my initial intuitive take. Yeah, I think you can do both. I mean, I will do both types of builds, but just for example, you know, Marquise Brown's a wide receiver. We like his ADP on underdog right now is 78. On FFPC, it's 99. Um, so you just start to see, you know, Jordan Addison, a rookie that's like pretty hard to get an underdog ADP of 68 there. He's 88 over on FFPC. So you start to see where these rounds that Justin kind of referred to an underdog is dead zones for wide receiver all of a sudden aren't dead zones. And you can start getting that quantity to make up for quality a little bit while still kind of hoping to bank like a legendary running back season early, which we know. Zero RB is great, but the best way to get one of those hugely important running back seasons is to draft one early. So I kind of like to do like hero running back builds or maybe too early and then a ton of wide receivers. But there are times based on where I'm drafting where I, you know, full zero RB still does work. Where you, you could just absolutely crush the field. And if you are doing full zero RB, I think it's important in that wide receiver mix early that you get an elite tight end um, to take advantage of the tight end premium scoring. You mentioned some wide receivers who are going way later on FFPC, and I assume that means that people are taking tight ends way higher, obviously because of the premium, and also more running backs are going in those like four, five, six rounds than go on underdog. Is that what you're saying? 
Yeah, definitely. So, um, you know, Najee Harris is going like 33rd overall. And I think he's like around later on. You know, he's, right. Well, he's, he's 37th overall on ADP. But, but like those add up, like every single running back's like right. five spots different. Okay. Yeah. It, honestly, it reminds me pretty similar to when I was drafting the BBM and going very strong with the hyper fragile builds because my key was like, hey, I know that people are going to be drafting those running backs in those middle areas back then with the dead zones. Where here, if you draft Christian McCaffrey, you know, normally we're drafting him three overall, he's probably pretty similarly here. So you're not giving up any value by grabbing the running back in the first round, but don't chase that later on when other people are now drafting running backs. That's when then you can get maybe Devontae Adams actually falls to like 17, 18 or something or wherever you are. Um, and that's where it's, okay, I'm, I like that hero RB that Leone was talking about. Now let me go with those other positions and I know I can keep finding value in these drafts. All right. That's going to do it for this look at how to approach and attack FFPC's best ball contest. Hope all these site-specific shows were useful for you guys. Again, the core was the episode or part one of what we did. If you want to play these different sites, I encourage you to listen to all of these. Hopefully, again, it was a very big help. Thanks for all the time from Justin Herzig and Michael Leone. Be sure you're following them on the Twitter machine at Justin Herzig at Two Hats One Mike. I am at Adam Levitan, all one word at as Establish the Run. Also, most importantly, there are videos going up a lot, including best ball streams from Herzig that are not on this podcast feed. Be sure you are subscribed to establish the run YouTube to be sure you find all that extra free content that is not on this podcast feed. We'll be back later for the final part of the series, which Leone is most excited about, advanced and counterintuitive strategies for best ball. If you've never had the sex before, that will be the episode <laughs> for you. For Justin Herzig. For Michael Leone. For producer Luke. I am Adam. Good luck everybody.